Welcome to the SMB Community Podcast with hosts Amy Babinchek, James Kernan, and Carl Polachek. Produced by Kernan Consulting and for the international MSP community, we are dedicated to making every IT professional a successful IT professional. Hey there, this is James Kernan with Kernan Consulting, and I'm here to talk a little bit about the Mastermind Peer Groups. So with the Mastermind Peer Groups, you get a powerful combination of customized coaching, accountability, and weekly synergy sessions with like-minded professionals from all around North America. These peer groups are really focused on sales, marketing, and growth. It's all about results. So I am your personal group facilitator, and you'll experience weekly accountability meetings, monthly trainings, and then quarterly face-to-face -face meetings where we all get together on a quarterly basis in fun cities all around America. So be prepared to take your business to new heights and see if you've got what it takes to be one of the Mastermind Peer Group members. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to the next edition of the SMB Community Podcast with Amy and James. How's it going, James? Hey, it's going well. Going well. How are you doing? I'm doing good, although I am in desperate need of a haircut. As I mentioned, my hair person is like, she injured her back really bad and she's been off work for three weeks and that's right when I was supposed to get my hair cut. So, you know, this whole short hair thing, uh, it means that if you miss your haircut for three weeks, you're in bad shape. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man, it it's driving me bonkers. I feel like I'm wearing a hat all the time. <laughs> it's crazy. I'm sure some of the listeners have that. Do you remember that old invention used to be on TV uh, infomercials? It was called the Floby. It fits on the end of your vacuum and sucks your hair up with a blade on it and it cuts your hair. The Floby. <laughs> Don't you remember? Uh, God, what's his what's his name? That famous actor during COVID. He was like, I've been cutting my hair with a Floby for decades. Yeah. Uh, it's like, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he must be an expert. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. I always I always thought you'd end up with a bowl haircut if you did the Floby. So, you know, that's yeah. a skill that I'd hope to not obtain. <laughs> yeah. It was uh before we dive into the agenda, quick haircut story. Third grade, my mom made my sister cut my hair. So it was one of those things where we're in the restroom, my sister goes, Sit down, sit down on the on the seat. Was this a punishment for you or for her? It, it, you know what? It was a punishment for both of us because I don't think she yeah. liked me at the time. But uh, I wish I wish everybody could see me. But the it was she was leaning over very carefully and she was cutting my bangs, and she went clip clip and then she cut up, and it went way up, and <laughs> she started laughing. Uh. And I was like, what did you do? What did you do? And I turned around and I looked in the mirror and it was like, oh my gosh. And she cut it way up, and I know she did it on purpose. So to even it out, they had to move it from here way up here, and I had this straight line of hair across. I mean, they should have left it. I was so embarrassed the next day at school. I went to a Catholic school at the time, and we had um, uh, we had mass. It was like a Wednesday morning. We had mass right as school started. So I came in with my coat, and I put my hoodie over my head, <laughs> so finally the nun came over and pulled it off of me and then of course everybody laughed so uh and you know i should have thought of like hair gel or something to comb it back but no i left the bangs down i i look like a dork for a couple of weeks but uh anyway so i, I was gonna say you know and today you don't even have bangs so we, yeah. <laughs> we get to see your full forehead today i've, I've, yeah. I've got the windblown look <laughs> the windblown look here in the midwest well, cool, cool. All right, so enough of the funny stories. So um, actually, I think we had a really cool question that came in that we were just chatting about. You want mm -hmm. to start off with that? Yeah, so the question, well, the question that came in was was one thing. And then the question that we were really talking about is, is how important is culture in an acquisition or a merger? Yeah. And... Uh, I think you you can't overemphasize it enough. And if you, uh, and I think it should be brought in early in the discovery process, mm -hmm. you know, having 
uh, Rian Buccianico and I have a little consultancy kind of on the side that we do called Sell My MSP. And what we really do is be that extra person in the room to help help the seller usually um, understand if this is going to be the right decision for his business. And yeah. culture is so important in that. And it should be initiated by the buyer because they're taking such a big risk. Right. But so many times they don't. They don't initiate those discussions at all. And to me, if you lose the culture of your acquisition, you're losing the institutional knowledge of that company. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the focus tends to be on, I'm buying these contracts and I've got these people and I have this skill set. But if you lose those people, you're losing that institutional knowledge that's the power behind everything. Right. And so that culture is, to me, is critical that you've got the good cultural fit you know mm -hmm. it's um so much emphasis on processes and you know are you a kaseya shop or a connectwise shop and you know that kind of stuff but if you have a uh if you have a culture where um you know memes are going back and forth all the time between people or maybe it's a very competitive type culture and then you bring in another group of people who's used to working in a team situation and maybe they don't meme all the time. They talk about, you know, movies and, and the great restaurant they ate at last night or whatever, just a, you know, a different, you got a different set of people with different, different ways of working, different ways of feeling like they, they fit in with their job. And that's so critical. Right. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. Let's, let's dig into that a little bit. Cause I agree with you a hundred percent and just, I don't know, for maybe the average listener, let's dig into culture a little bit and and maybe, you know, what's your definition of culture? Try to elaborate a little bit more on maybe questions the buyer could ask or what it looks like to to everybody. Cause it's um I mean it's talked about so often and it it is a pretty broad topic, but I, I kind of want to drill into it, if that makes sense. Yeah, so <clears throat> If you're the if you're the buyer, I think you do need to understand how the staff works, mm -hmm. and, and not as much from a process point of view. Because you know if they're if they're used to using Autotask, we kind of know what their work process looks like, but you don't really know what their work culture looks like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, culture is just so often about about teamwork. So ask those questions around um, how the employees communicate with one another. Right. Yeah. Do they stand up and shout across the room? Do they do they you know, do they meet around the, the water cooler? Do they go to lunch together? Uh, you know. Do they have a, uh, in my company, always had a, a Teams chat that was kind of going all day where they were constantly bouncing stuff off of each other? Yeah. Um, you know, or is it a competitive thing, right? Yeah. I close this many tickets. You only close that many tickets. I'm the winner. You know, uh, companies have radically different internal cultures. Um, and if you bring it, employee in who's used to working in one culture and throw them into another culture, they're going to be uncomfortable. Right. Right. Yeah. It's interesting just to help elaborate a little bit. I, I got some funny stories, but quickly just uh, Googling a little bit more about the definition <laughs> of a culture in a business, a company culture is how you do what you do in the workplace. It's the sum of your formal and informal systems, behaviors, and values all of which create an experience for your employees and your customers. It's a core company culture is how things get done around the workplace. So exactly what you were just saying, you know, it's how you interact. You know, there was a, the very first sales job I had in technology, I, I got promoted really quickly and was doing really, really well. Mm -hmm. Our company actually just moved from this little ugly strip center into a really pretty new uh, commercial business park. We had all glass walls. It was a new build out. And I, I got the office closest to the bullpen area. 
in the old office culture used to be like an open bullpen where you just you'd be on the phone and turn around and say, hey, you know, and you'd ask questions. And I loved all that energy all day long. When I moved into this new office, it was a cool office, but I felt like I was being punished. It was quiet. I was all by myself and I hated it. And it was within a week mm -hmm. I went to the owner and I said, look, I thanks, but no thanks. I, I want to be back out on the floor. I don't like being in an office. So, um, you know, culture, just like Amy was saying, I think is so critically important. And it has a lot to do with the people, how they interact uh, during working hours and then also after working hours. There was a there was a, a client of mine that I, I helped early on as a consultant uh, grow and it was a great success story. They were up in uh, Temecula, California. First time I went to visit them, they had, you know, uh, there was two partners in the business. They had one employee and they were working out of the back door of the warehouse of one of their customers. And their sign was just a little little real estate yard sign that went in. It was hilarious, you know, you know, <laughs> with the, the name of the business with an arrow pointing in the back. Anyway, they went from that, like nothing. They had a couple accounts. They're really bright technically. And then they grew, you know, over uh, $15 million in a short period of time. So real incredible success story. So uh, they were actually acquired by a big company back east. So they were on the West Coast. They were acquired by a big HP dealer. Uh, they dealt with the big HP enterprise solutions and services. And you know, that's our rare skill set. <clears throat> so this company back east bought them. And I remember talking to my my friend. And I said, how are things going? He goes, I hate it. I hate it. You know, one day I was in a meeting and I just asked the guys, I was trying to joke around and he had a funny, quirky sense of humor. He said, uh, mm -hmm. Hey, uh, you know, what, what color socks are you guys wearing or what kind of socks? And he was always big on like wearing all these goofy socks like Superman or, you know, Spider-Man or whatever. And he just thought it was really boring. Everybody looked at him like he was a, a foreigner uh, and, you know, just uh, anyway, he, he felt like he was out of place. And anyway, long story short, he ended up buying the business back from the company in less than six months just because it, it didn't work out. Uh, and it was really a culture clash. They were completely different and used to running things a whole different way. And I, uh, you know, these mergers and acquisitions, they sound all sexy on the outside. But just to Amy's point, it's really important to ask lots of hard questions about how you all interact every day and what things look like, you know. And, you know, he, he basically said work wasn't fun anymore. And I, I don't want to do it that way. So I think it's pretty interesting. You know, that is such a big part of it, isn't it? If you're, if you're, if the employees leave the company that you purchased, it's going to be yeah. such a loss. It'll be so hard for you to recoup the financial level of that company in time for, for you to not lose money on the deal. Yeah. Um, and like you said, you know, fun is maybe too strong of a word. I don't know if people come to work because it's fun, but they come to it, you know, they don't dislike it when they're there, right? They're happy. They're happy and they're productive while they're while they're working. And um, that's just so, so, so important. I think I think if you're looking to make an acquisition or do a merger, you need to start investigating the culture right away. Yeah. I would put that right at the top of your list. Yeah. Yeah. And and to to your point, I, I think, uh, you know, as a buyer, when you're buying something, spending lots of money, time and resources, the last thing you want are the best people leaving or you, or your customers leaving. And the, the concept is in most cases, you want to keep it the same. You want to try to embrace that culture and, and if, if anything, improve on it, you know, make it even more fun, give them more resources to even grow the business and be more successful. That's what most buyers want. And um, so just remember that, because I think that's super important. And I've seen lots of acquisitions fall apart in a very short period of time, really because of the culture clash. Yeah. So we have a second important question today, and that is um, it's about customers' outcome, mm -hmm. right? So uh, we just talked about kind of merger and acquisition outcome. Now, now it's about 
customer outcome and how you know why why is customer outcome so important yeah um you want to kick us off on that one I, I actually think these things are a little bit related yeah they are related it's it's funny i mean it seems like we talk a little bit about this every single week you know but uh and you know we've been in the channel for a long time and it seems like a lot of the old school things just get rebranded and renamed you know uh you know customer outcome yesterday was customer experience you know and the day customer before success that, customer success and <laughs> customer service um you know, but I, I like this one in particular because it really focuses on the customer. And number two, and more importantly, it, it focuses on us, not just the experience, but really the business outcome. And many of my sales training sessions that I, I teach techie business owners, it's really have a business conversation, not a techie conversation. Most executive C-suite are not super duper technical or maybe not nearly as technical as you are. So in, in layman's terms, we need to kind of dumb it down, but have a business conversation. Talk about, you know, business issues or business challenges that they're having and then how our technology, you know, through people, process and technology, how we can solve that business challenge into a favorable outcome. You know, maybe it's going to that outcome is I'm gonna, they're going to make more money where they're going to save more money, where they're going to increase customer morale or employee morale, uh, reduce their turnover. Those are those are examples of, of outcome. But I think it has everything to do with our, our mindset in inside of our culture, you know, and how we interact as a team with our customers and then, uh, you know, and in, including our strategic partners. So what are what are your thoughts? Because I, I think you were just in the middle of a conversation on this. Yeah, I always find that um, when I'm talking to a, a business business owner or the management team of the company, um, that a great messaging revolved around productivity, right? So when we were doing projects with them, how is this going to impact their employees, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of a lot of people are change adverse because they see the negative on the productivity of their employees. Oh, we're going to change something and that's going to be hard for them. They're going to have to learn new things. They're going to complain. They're going to ask me questions, you know, whatever it is. Right. And uh, um, so, so we always wanted to put a positive spin on that is, you know, yeah, there's going to be some learning curve here and, you know, we're going to help you through that. We're going to help your employees. And, um, you know, in the end, <clears throat> what we're going to see here, you know, is, is some, some great productivity increase from your staff, right? So instead of having to hire more people, you're going to be able to do more with the people that you have. And that was always great messaging, right? That that was a good outcome that they were going to look forward to that would help us get past the pain of moving through that project because there's always pain in projects. Yeah. So anytime we're doing that, we want to focus on the, the long-term outcome so that the short-term pain will be seen in the correct light. And um, to me, that was really what our communication needed to focus on, that long-term outcome anytime that we were talking about a project. Yeah, and the customer experience, you're right, is a little, a little different. You know, one of, the, one of the tenets that I always hit in my business is we never wanted to put any barriers between the customer and us. And I, I, see, I see a lot of MSPs do put up barriers between the customer and themselves, and it puzzles me. Yeah. Um, you know, I do see MSPs as a customer service business, mm -hmm. and when a customer wants service, they want to talk to somebody in the way that they are used to communicating. Yeah. Right? We're we're there to serve them. So, uh, in my business, I never focused. You know, tried to focus my clients into communicating with us in in one particular way. We always let them communicate with us in the way that was most comfortable to them. Mm -hmm. Because having the customer be comfortable communicating to you was important for us to be able to do our job too, right? We would get better information from them if they weren't frustrated at having to be funneled through a system that they weren't comfortable with. Right. Yeah. Whether that's filling out a form, going to a website, you know, having to use teams, 
you know, whatever, whatever it was, we would just say, you know, contact us. I don't care if it's email, text, teams, you know, whatever, call right. us, whatever, whatever they were comfortable, do it because that was like the very front end of the whole customer experience. Yeah. Right. Yep. We don't want to make them uncomfortable from the, from the get go. Yeah. Yeah. And you kind of have to gently, you know, especially if it's a prospect and you don't really know them very well, you know, go into the meeting prepared and ask the right questions. Everybody always likes talking about things that they're passionate about. That's why most MSP business owners want to have a tech conversation and talk about the speeds and the feeds and the latest and greatest of this and that. But we ultimately want to have a business conversation. But I always like kind of on a personal level, Amy starting off a prospect meeting by, you know, one coming in prepared, like I know in advance because I went on their LinkedIn profile. You know, they're the CEO for the last 10 years and they went to San Diego State University. They're an Aztec. And it was like, hey, I, I saw that you went to San Diego State. I lived in San Diego for a long time. You know, did you grow up there? And and tell me about your family, because uh, I could tell that they were married. I saw some pictures of their kids, you know, talk about kids or family or where they went to college. I mean, that that's a five minute conversation right there. And then gently go into, tell me more about the business and where's the business going? You know, or do you plan on growing uh, in the next three to five years? Are you going to stay the same? You know, you have any big plans, uh, you know, uh, from a, a growth initiative or, or um, you know, acquisition or mergers? Mm -hmm. Try to understand more from the business perspective. And then we're smart enough to kind of understand where some of the challenges may lie. Uh, and then you can start sculpting questions around solutions at that point in time, but you want to get them talking. And here's a quick um, uh, industry best practice. If you, in a sales meeting, a prospect meeting, or even a customer meeting, if you are speaking more than 40%, that's bad. You know, you want them, you want the other person, at, you want to ask good questions and let them talk so you can learn you ask clarifying questions and then kind of lead on, but typically you want to be only speaking no more than 40% of the conversation. Uh, so they have 60%. Does that make sense? Uh, totally. I think we just somehow segued into how to hold a sales meeting, but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one of the, one of the, the things that I did and um, I, I, you know, I would, I would also often take, in fact, I always took employees with me at least, one employee with me yeah. um, to the to these potential sales meetings just so that they could see how how it was done and how we were talking to customers, particularly if they were going to be supporting the customer in that area. And um, they mostly didn't say anything, but they just kind of watched and observed. And when it came to the techie talk, they would sometimes jump in and talk the techie stuff. But yeah. they were always amazed that um, for my my sales technique was I never really told the customer what it was we were going to do, right? Mm -hmm. My job there was to listen to them. Yes. And one of the first things that, that I, that I asked uh, was always to take a tour. Like, can you show me around? Yep. Right. Yep. And if it, uh, we have a lot of manufacturing in this area. So that was kind of a process. I'm like, it, you know, they'd walk out and say, well, like, this is accounting and, I'm like, I'm like, no, 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 let's do it. How, show, show me the stuff you guys make. Like, let's start in the back where the raw material comes in and then walk, walk us through, you know, from the back, back of the shop all the way to the front of the shop, right? So we're going to see the raw materials coming in and, and, you know, how everything is built. And then in the front, who does, you know, who's doing the CAD work, who's doing the project planning, who's doing the sales, who's doing the accounting, right? We see the supporting staff around the actual product production. And yeah. that, man, that really opened customers up. Yeah. And I would do the same thing if if they were even, um, a, you know, an accounting firm or a law firm, um, they would start off by just sort of like, you know, randomly pointing to people and things as we sort of strolled through the office and I'd be like, no, no, let's do this from a systems point of view. You know, I've, I'm coming to you as a potential customer. Now what happens? And yeah. um, 
they that did ramp, ramp them up. They got really excited about how their business works. It goes from here to here to here to here. Then we came back into the conference room. Um, it's interesting because we were sort of talking along the way on this in this tour takes probably half an hour, right? We're talking along the way, kind of back and forth. We're getting to know each other a little bit on that tour and meeting people in the office. By the time they've done that, they've already decided that that we're experts and they need us. <laughs> it was it was it was a it was a pretty great process, honestly. Yeah, we, we used to do the same thing. I trained to that. That's that's a good point, uh, Amy, because you learn a lot by walking around the office. I mean, you can look at how much money they spend on infrastructure, you know, if they've yep. got a bunch of, you know, white box computers with, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I got to jump in and tell you, there's a couple of times that, <laughs> that we did the walk around and at the end of the walk around, I'd be like, you know, my mind as we're going along, my mind is like, uh, how can I get out of here? Yeah. Right. This yeah. this customer is not going to not going to be for us because I can see they the office hasn't been redecorated since the 1980s and the computers are all broken down and, you know, right. the shop's a mess or whatever. And I'm like, this is not uh, we we only do we only do good work when clients value their technology yeah. and see it as critical to their business success. And when you're doing that walk around, you can see if that's the. Right. If that's their mindset or not. And if they don't and have it, then I'm not a good fit. Exactly. And what Amy just said there is really important. Uh, they have to value technology. They have to see that as a competitive advantage in their business. That should be part of everybody's ideal customer profile requirements. You know, if they don't value technology, then they're going to be a nightmare to work with. So mm -hmm. keep keep your eye out for that. So that's that's a good point. And then also, if you see a a bunch of Cisco boxes on the floor of the server room, you know, with your competitor's name on it, you know, there's some good Intel um, lying around on the floors as well. So, <laughs> I, I remember that. remember one business in particular we went to is a a large uh, replacement window manufacturer, mm -hmm. and. Um, and you know we went went to meet them, and uh, it's a name that you see on all the television commercials, right? So this is a pretty pretty big outfit. Um, and after being there for a few minutes and you know learning a little bit about the business, we could see that they were one of those companies that they had not invested their 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 shop area where they were doing their manufacturing was was beautiful and really advanced and modern but the front end office was not at all and then he started to he brought us brought in another person to start to talk to us about their COBOL application that they had that ran the whole ran the whole place hmm. and and um, they had brought her back from retirement because it needs constant gear and feeding I was like all right this is not for us <laughs> yeah, right <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. I'm not getting involved in supporting some COBOL application from the 70s or 80s. <laughs> so, no, that's good. That's good. Yeah. And if, and if anybody has any further questions about, you know, prospect first visits or uh, customer visits, QBRs, culture, uh, customer experience, any of that, just uh, reach out to either Amy or I. Uh, you could drop something up on the smbcommunitypodcast.com site. Or just email us directly, you know, james at kernanconsulting.com. We'd love to answer your questions and chat about it. So we'd love to hear from you. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. So, hey, James, yeah. what's coming up? Any last uh, thoughts about where where folks can see you soon? I am really excited because I think when this airs, I might be on a cruise ship uh, in the Caribbean for 10 days. I'm going to be working on my tan, doing a little R and R, but uh, so that's what's coming up next for me. But uh, after that, so that's here in February and uh, in March, I've got a. Um, I think the next thing I have is, is the Mastermind Conference down in Austin, Texas. We've got a behind the scenes tour of uh, Ninja One headquarters in downtown Austin, so we'll be down there and uh, for two days of an action packed. Um, uh, agenda. 
So if anybody's interested in learning more about that, I'll drop the link in the show notes. And then uh, I know you're doing a little traveling too. I am. I'm going to flooded California. Okay. And uh, hopefully by the time I get there, the floods will be gone. And hopefully by the time this podcast airs, the floods will be gone too. Because they're, as we're recording this, they're quite, quite in a suffering stage right now out there. Yeah, but no uh, yep, I'm going out to SMB Tech Fest. And so hopefully I'm going to meet some of our, our listeners out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I hope nothing uh, further happens. But yeah, the, the news is making it out to be pretty devastating. And um, hopefully that, that joke won't come true about that uh, beach property in the state of Nevada. Jeez, uh, yes, the flooding in California. I mean, some of the videos were pretty... They were pretty horrific this morning. So yeah, I think eight eight to fourteen inches of rain and in, in a couple day time frame, it's a little spooky. Yeah, so yeah. Prayers go out to those guys. So anyway, we'll save travels on that. Thank I've you. Got, uh, one other thing, I've got five minutes with a smart person. Got a fun interview lined up with Val King, and Val King is like many of you, uh, MSP business owner. And I like when MSP business owners also, you know, use that entrepreneur business experience and then they open up a channel business, but they've opened up a Ascent portal, which is a, a security portal and technology and, and service. And they've, they initially did that for their customers and it was so popular that they've created a channel program. So I'm going to be talking to Val King about that a little bit as well. So make sure you listen in there. So I've gotten to know Val here over the past year, uh, very much an impressive man and a uh, man of many talents, but uh, the uh, CEO and founder of, of White Hat Virtual, an MSP out of Austin, Texas, and also Ascent Portal, which is a, a rising uh, cybersecurity uh, channel organization, but also I've got a decorated history as a IT executive for healthcare and for banking and so forth. Normally, I have people on the program that represents just one of those three things, and and you represent all three. So, what are what are some of the other services? Uh, elaborate a little bit more on uh, Ascent Portal. You know, I know there there's pen testing and VDI. Like sure. That. So, can you elaborate? So, on uh, yeah, at a, at a at a very high level. I'll, I'll just cover White Hat very quickly, managed IT services, doing security and doing compliance, and even managed virtual desktops. We strategize with organizations a lot on work from home since the pandemic of, of how to do that well from a technology perspective. And on the Ascent side, it's uh, getting right from a compliance standpoint uh, from everything from cybersecurity to uh, if you're regulated and have some sort of framework or frameworks that you have to be in compliance with, making sure you're there, and then wrapping the services around that from a security perspective to provide the expertise in terms of baseline assessments and doing remediation and really everything you need um, to be successful um, with a compliance program, you know, from a, from a channel partner perspective, or again, even direct, and that I don't want to put you in a place where you're going to fail, right? I say all the time, I can make myself look stupid. I don't need a vendor's help. So we've, we've, tried, to, we've tried to put pieces around it to, to make sure you're going to be successful. I, I don't like buying, you know, buying, paying money, subscribing to things that we don't use, that we don't get value out of. So it's yeah. really all the supporting services around Descent were designed to make sure that not only will the product work for you, but there's services around it to make sure that it's meaningful and that it it, it will it will create value, uh, or or you know we'll we'll come back and 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 die trying basically because I don't want to waste anybody's time or money because I really don't like mine wasted. Uh, any any final words of wisdom to to leave the audience? Uh, IT should be a competitive advantage for your business, and you do not need to be a rocket scientist to get value out of it, but yeah. don't ignore it either. It's very easy to focus on the things you know and the things you're comfortable with and not pay attention to IT, but you've got competitors that are not doing that, that are paying attention to IT. So uh, it's very easy to get behind the axle, build a, you know around the axle, uh, have a lot of technical debt and to put yourself in a difficult situation 
because you're not paying attention to it. So it's not scary. There's probably three or four things that plain old normal people can do to get a handle on it to make sure that uh, it it serves you and serves your business and serves the, the fire in your belly that gets you out of bed every day. If it's baking bread, selling flowers, whatever you want to do, make sure you're leveraging it as a tool to get to do the thing that you wanted to do when you took all the risk in the first place. Don't let it be something that tears your business up or slows you down because it's just not that difficult. We just make it sound that way in this industry. Yep. Yep. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. All right, Val. Hey, thanks for spending some time with us today. Um, everybody uh, tune in to the SMB community podcast and uh, we'd love to hear from you. So if you've got any questions out there, uh, whether it's for Val or myself, feel free to reach out to me, let me know, and we're happy to address those on the program, or I could reach out to Val for you, uh, james at kernanconsulting.com. And uh, Val, thanks again for being on the program. You have a great rest of your day. Thank you, sir. Let's close out the show with that today. We'll see you guys all next week. Thanks for listening to the SMB Community Podcast.